Well, welcome everybody. Happy holidays. This is the final forum of the 2013 season. Uh, we'll be announcing our lineup uh, for 2014 early next year, but I, will, I can tell you one that we definitely have planned, which is January 21st with Harvard researchers Eris Aydin and Jean-Baptiste Michel to talk about their new book, Uncharted Big Data as a Lens on Human Culture, which is a fascinating look at uh, how you can sort of uh, analyze humankind through the big data that we now have available. So that's uh, January 21st. Now after today's program, just so you know, Governor Miller has kindly agreed to stay behind and sign copies of his book. You can buy copies from our friends at Barnes & Noble right over here, and I strongly suggest you do so. It's a wonderful read. And as usual today, we will, if you could put up the number for uh, questions, we'll take questions electronically. Uh, you can text 310 seven five one zero seven one five or email forum questions at milkeninstitute.org. We'll put that up throughout the uh, program tonight, but then they will be read. We can just get through a lot more questions that way. Now we're delighted to have Governor Miller with us today. Uh, interviewing him is Joel Kurtzman. Uh, Joel is a senior fellow at the Milken Institute and executive director of our senior fellows program. But before I turn it over to Joel, we have a special guest. I would like to hand things over to our chairman, Mike Milken, who will introduce the governor. Mike? Well, good afternoon, and, and this is a great honor for me to be able to introduce uh, Governor Miller. I thought I'd first start with a few facts that didn't make Governor Miller's book, but you might find interesting. Uh, first, for a number of years in Lake Tahoe over July 4th, I had the honor of hosting uh, Governor Miller, and we had a three-on-three -three basketball tournament. And uh, Governor Miller and I played on the same team for three or four years. And uh, Larry Ellison was one of our, our team members, um, and we had Paul Verkill, who was about six, seven thin, had played for North Carolina, but our entire team was over 50. And we constantly competed with other individuals who warmed up by back stuffing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I'm happy to say I, I think our team uh, was never defeated. Bob worked inside. Uh, Paul, even though he was 6'7", preferred to shoot 20 feet from the basket. Uh, and uh, we had the great excitement of beating uh, Ross Miller's team, uh, who is uh, Bob's son, a great athlete, uh, and one of the great leaders in our country today um, from those times. So we eventually stopped this game as we got older, so uh, from that standpoint. But much of what's happened uh, happened under Bob's leadership. And to think about Las Vegas today, I'd like to take you back 40 years or so, and at that time, most of your major financial institutions would not buy gaming securities. There was an image, an environment that they were all run, you know, by owned secretly by all the gangsters at that time. And I remember in around 1981 or 82, we took a group over to Las Vegas uh, Hartford Insurance and many of the insurance companies. And over a two-day period of time, <clears throat> they were surprised to find out that many of the people working in this industry had PhDs in mathematics. And this is one of the few industries in the world where you can identify where every cent goes. And I think the thing that really made the difference to them is when we showed them the tapes that you were being recorded. So when you walk in these casinos, you might not know this, but you very easily are being recorded. And so afterwards, if the win on a particular table was more than one or more than two standard deviations, they would pull up the entire event that occurred on that table and blow it up where they could watch the dealer's hands, who was at the table, and whether there was anything going on at that time. And I think that was really the turning point for people to realize that this industry was really an industry based on 
mathematics, the probability of winning the odds, etc., and that it was probably the most closely watched industry in the world. And my own firm that I worked for for more than a decade would not let us finance companies in this industry. Uh, we could trade them, we could be the largest market maker, but we would not give them capital. And for almost a decade, until 1978, was the first time we were able to give them capital. And it was really interesting to see. Now, this whole event is capped a decade later when Fortune magazine rates Mirage Resorts the second most admired company in the world. Second most. So you've gone from an industry where you cannot give them capital, their piranha, to the second most admired company in the world through customer service. And if you think about that industry, you know, where, you, where you're running a Four Seasons in some city that has 300 rooms that your, your people go to sleep that are staying there at 11 and they wake up at 7 versus running a hotel with 3,000 rooms where the main shift is from 10 to 4 in the morning. And you have to run it 24 hours a day from that standpoint. The other point I would make to you is that there are things that change the course of history. And if you want to go back to your magazines on Nevada, you will see that in 1970, it looked like Reno was going to be the great futurist city of America. They talked about where it was located and, and things like that. But the farmers in northern Nevada decided they wanted to go no growth. And so the largest casino in this country was opened in the 1970s, MGM, out near the airport, near in Reno. But Las Vegas grew because of a no-growth strategy or a low-growth strategy in Reno, or the world might have been substantially different. So everything goes back to leadership, whether it was the building of what's Wind Resorts or Mirage, or whether it's today the Las Vegas Sand and Venetian, a decision made by those individuals. And Nevada was so lucky that they had a, a person dedicated to the state named Bob Miller who went into public service and became the governor of Nevada. And we, during his governorship, moved on the leading scientific retreat in the world for cancer up to Lake Tahoe that Bob joined us at and welcomed the scientists from all over the world every year to Nevada. Now, Bob, you didn't have to get prostate cancer just because you were welcoming all those scientists I've always uh, admired you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> so, but there isn't a challenge that Bob hasn't met. And one of the other things that I, I wanted to point out for Governor Miller, first, a wonderful family. And how do you judge a person? You often judge by their children. And Bob's son, Ross, went to Monterey Tech before he went to Stanford. And I, and I asked Bob, why... Why is Ross going to Monterey Tech? And I think the future of our country, with such a large participation by people from Latin America, this state approaching 50%, uh, and the technology at Monterey Tech really underline both the vision Bob had and the commitments that Ross had by going down to Mexico for a year before he went to Stanford. And, and I will never forget that. But the leadership that Bob brought brought great growth to the state. You can read about it in President Clinton's uh, part of the book where he talks about how Las Vegas and Nevada is the only state that doubled every decade in, in this century, in the last century and in terms of its growth, but changed. Another area you might not realize that dramatically changed were the arts in many ways. And so... In the 1970s and before, if you found a great person who was set design or artist, you would find them often in New York City on Broadway shows. But the world changed, and those who were the most talented came to Las Vegas because you could spend $100 million building sets and designing a show, and there wasn't any place else really in the world that you could recoup that investment that came there 
with those Cirque du Soleil shows and other shows in Vegas. In terms of medicine and science, one of the great contributions is the Lou Ruvo Brain Health Center, which is part of the Cleveland Clinic, that Governor Miller was instrumental with his relationship with Larry Ruvo in making sure it was built, and it's a great center today for the whole country. So today you're getting an, an in, to see an individual who is really in many ways responsible for the enormous growth and success uh, of not only a, a state, but of an industry. Uh, and, the, and the framing of that industry in a legal sense, in a reporting sense, and it's a pleasure, Bob, to see you here today. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, and welcome, Governor. Thanks, but I can't top that introduction, so I'll start signing <laughs> books. Uh. <laughs> Well, it's interesting because a lot of your book is about the pre-Mike Milken era mm -hmm. of uh, Las Vegas. And, and if you can see from that slide, this is what greeted you, slide one, let me put it up there. In 1955, when you arrived in Las Vegas with your family, but your family had something of a atypical uh, background when it comes to business and the kinds of dealings that they were in. Would you like to uh, talk about what your father did for a living in Chicago before Las Vegas? Sure, I mean, that's the, the tone of the book. Uh, although the book is uh, in reality an autobiography, it, it's not about me. It's seeing Las Vegas through me and the transformation and the common metamorphosis uh, in my own family. My father had been a bookie in Chicago. Uh, and as you might expect, a bookie in Chicago in the 1950s uh, had to live in a in difficult world and, and had many associations that under today's standards would never be acceptable. Uh, but in Las Vegas at that point in time, uh, a fledgling industry needed people with experience. And the only people who had experience gained it somewhere else. And if it was somewhere else, it was illegal. So he was one of those early people who came to Las Vegas, which I characterize in the book as the land of second chances. Uh, it was a small community, about 55,000 people, and that gives you an idea what the Strip looked like. The, the Strip, by the way, that, that would be today one of the most photographed uh, signs in the world, the people at the end of the Strip with the magnificent view that you'll see a little later. Um, at then, that's what it looked like. And the only reason there is a Strip, the Strip was the highway to, to here, to Los Angeles. And the city council decided they were going to raise some gaming taxes uh, in the late 40s, early 50s. And I believe it was Belden Cattlemen who built the old rancho. They said, the hell with that. I'm just going to go out to the county limits, which was Sahara Boulevard. If those of you are familiar with Las Vegas, uh, it is now uh, going to be a new hotel, but uh, was a Sahara Hotel. And he built it on the other side of the street. And that started the Las Vegas Strip. And then Bugsy Siegel built uh, the Flamingo Hotel a little further out, uh, designed to be an individual ranch resort. Uh, and his was the first creative concept of a resort as opposed to just the saloons that had been in downtown Las Vegas. Now, now um, when you moved there, you were a young kid, and you mentioned in your book, which, by the way, this is a fantastic book, and, and it's so entertaining and interesting to get uh, the background of a governor of a growing, fast growing state who had such a, an interesting and uh, colorful background. But you say in, uh, when you came to Las Vegas, your church had an interesting dress code. And uh, do you want to talk about what you couldn't wear in church? Well, it, yeah, it, it was very hot in Las Vegas. Some of you have probably been there in the summer and, and know that, but this was prior to air conditioning. <clears throat> and uh, it was a Catholic church, it was kind of small. Um, and it was overfilled on mass uh, on occasions. Uh, and being the summer, some people had to stand outside. And finally, the priest had to say one day, you know, those of you that are coming communion, please put a cover over your bathing suits. So again, atypical. So um, let me, we're having some trouble here with the slides. So can we have slide two? <laughs> we'll do it the old-fashioned way. 
So um, this is your father, mm -hmm. and he, he was also in Chicago, his own <clears throat> the bouncer at uh, his hotel. So he was a, he was a, a rough and tumble guy. Well, it was far from a hotel in Chicago. It was a bar, burlesque hall with a bookie joint in the back. And he and his brother, Herschel, who subsequently came to Vegas, also were the bouncers. They just took care of everything themselves. Um, you know, they'd grown up a uh, family of five in southern Illinois, kind of my father, high school diploma was a GED. Uh, you know, he lived uh, a tough way. He was a tough guy. Uh, he used to promote boxing matches, et cetera. Uh, this was a change in character for him and a great opportunity. The Riviera that you see behind there opened uh, late 1954, early 55. The original owners uh, went under financially, uh, included two of the Marx brothers, Harpo and I forget the other one, was Gummo. Gummo or Gummo, yeah, Gummo. Or, uh, not Groucho. Uh, and then my dad came with a second group of owners. Uh, the second group of owners was chaired by a man named Gus Greenbaum. Now to put Gus Greenbaum in context, when Bugsy Siegel was murdered, as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, Gus Greenbaum and a man named uh, Mo uh, Sedway walked into the hotel and said, we're in charge. Nobody disagreed. <laughs> Uh, Gus Greenbaum went on and came over the Riviera and was chairman of the board of the Riviera. And I remember it was traumatic about three years later, uh, I was still in my early teens, and Gus Greenbaum and his wife were murdered in their house in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Um, my father had a small percentage initially, which wasn't a percentage, it was called points. And the reason it was called points is that that way you could sell to an excess of 100. <laughs> now, I hope the mathematicians that Michael were talking about are a little better at figuring that out because they seem to ignore the fact that that literally diminished your percentage, but they just sold points. And he worked his way up to eventually to be chairman of the board of the Riviera. So his, his boss was murdered by the mob? The chairman of the board was uh, ostensibly murdered by the mob, and I think it's a reasonable conclusion that that's probably what happened. And he worked his way up as well. He, he, he was like a pit boss, and then he was a uh, floor manager, and then he was a casino manager, and then he, then he became chairman of the board before he sold out in 1968. And this man? That guy was murdered too. Uh, that's Bugsy Siegel. Uh, and uh, he really is the, you have to excuse who he is, but he was a creative visionary that made Las Vegas begin the process to what it is today. Uh, he's the one that took it out onto the strip. He's the one that built a ranch-style place uh, and tried to attract people to come for more than just a, a couple hours. You know, Las Vegas, prior to that, was a railroad stop for watering on the way to Los Angeles. And there was a block downtown uh, that was, uh, at that time, legal prostitution. Uh, I know you think in terms of legal prostitution in Nevada, but it, it isn't legal in the county that Las Vegas is. At that time it was, and some saloons. And they used to have to hurry it up and toot the whistle a lot to get the people back onto the train when it was going to LA. Uh, Bugsy Siegel took it to a different concept and tried to bring in famous Hollywood celebrities and so on and so forth. And as you saw in the movie about him or read about him, you know, he apparently expended more money than he'd been given by his contemporaries and they in fact murdered him. But he started the Las Vegas process of evolution. So uh, this was not a risk-tolerant environment if you made a mistake. Sure, certainly not then, no. <laughs> and, and this is... That's the, what it looked like. This is his hotel that yeah, really... Yeah, you can see the ranch style, and when we moved to Las Vegas, the only exception to that was the Riviera. As you saw in the picture with my dad, it was eight stories at that time, and my dad and his partners were ridiculed. They said, why the hell would you build a hotel that needs an elevator? We've got all this land. And uh, it was, in fact, the first high-rise uh, in southern Nevada. So um, if you look at this picture, it shows you what the entertainment in Las Vegas was <laughs> before uh, all of the growth of the casinos and the hotels. And uh, it was quite a western town, wasn't it? It was, and still is to some degree. But uh, there was about 50,000 people. Most people knew each other. There was only a few high schools at the time. Uh, and the Hell Dorado Parade was a huge event. Uh, everybody participated, the schools participated, the hotels had huge floats. Um, I do a PowerPoint uh, speech of which these slides are extracted from, and I follow kind of a different theme than the book so that people that have read the book don't have to listen to it again. So I don't refer to this specifically in the book, but the line in the, in the speech that I give 
is along the lines of that this is Las Vegas had become a place where cowboys and showgirls could coexist. You can see the showgirl on the back of the cart there. Uh, and it, it just uh, was the change from the old cowboy saloons was just another step in that process to the Las Vegas we know today. Now, um, you were saying in the book, and Mike uh, mentioned in his remarks, that funding for new businesses in uh, Las Vegas is very difficult to get. Yeah. So you had to turn to unusual sources, one of which was That's organized the landlord, yeah. crime, and the other was uh, the Teamsters. So Well, the, the Central State Pension Fund of the Teamsters Union was the primary source of revenue. No conventional financing was available for anybody. So it's either your personal money, which could come in cash and could have come from unnamed sources, or if you had a traceable money, it was from the Teamster Union Central State Pension Fund. So, you know, Jimmy Hoffa there was in effect the landlord of Las Vegas for many years. I'm pretty sure right across from him is his successor, Frank Fitzsimmons. Uh, from the angle of the photo, I can't be 100% positive, but I'd, I'd met him several times, so I'm pretty sure that's him. And if you look in the row that, that Jimmy Hoffa is in, at the far end, there is a gentleman talking to a lady at the very end. And his name is Jay Sarno, who played a, uh, another pivotal role in the evolution of Las Vegas that I'll mention in a, in a little bit. Now, you met Jimmy Hoffa when you were a boy, and he, he came to your house. I did, yeah. Uh, and, you know, I was a bit in awe of him at the time. Uh, by that time, I was in my later teens, and, uh, you know, he had a national recognition. I mean, he, he, he's a person that spoke with presidents, but he also had, uh, you know, background questions raised about him. So. Uh, my father introduced me to him and then let, made sure I was out of the room. <laughs> but you, well, that's a good point because in the book you make, a, you make a strong point that your father did not want you in that business no. and wouldn't even allow cards in the house. Exactly. He, had, he, as I said, had a GED. He was determined that I was going to have uh, higher education than that, wanted me to be a lawyer, which he had wanted to be himself but was unable to be uh, and did not want me in the gaming industry. Ironically, now I'm the lead director of uh, Win Resorts and, and the longest serving director of international game technology, both obviously gaming companies. So uh, his uh, advice didn't stick. I eventually it caught up with him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and here we see some of the change in entertainment from the wagons and uh, square dancing. Yeah, um, this, is, this is an element that's, uh, again, I don't specifically mention this in the book, but the fellow on the far uh, left, I, I'm looking at it maybe differently than you are, but in the lighter color suit on the end, uh, is named Mo Dalitz. Mo Dalitz was uh, well recognized as a member of the Cleveland mob and had a very significant position within it. But in Las Vegas, and the guy next to him obviously recognized Elvis Presley, I mentioned when I do the prepared remarks that uh, one of the national magazines uh, called Elvis's initial appearance in Las Vegas as uh, something like uh, a beer hall and a champagne party. Uh, but he got a little better as time went on. Mo Dalitz, besides his reputation, was the hidden owner of the Desert Inn and, and the Stardust Hotels and the Frontier. And he also built the first private hospital in Las Vegas, the first indoor shopping center, was very involved in the community. Uh, and the Chamber of Commerce named him Man of the Year one year. Uh, so uh, kind of an interesting background and he plays into some of the changes in Las Vegas that uh, we'll discuss in a second. So um, a as you look at the, this is kind of the first era mm -hmm. of Las Vegas where you have heavy influence of crime uh, in terms of the investors. You have pension funds that had uh, kind of rep disreputable reputations and people with uh, checkered pasts. And then that, that era kind of changed uh, when this man came in and started investing. That's right. Howard Hughes had been coming to Las Vegas for a long period of time. He liked the dry air and the like. He even had a house there at one point in time. But he'd sold that and subsequently he was staying in the uh, Desert Inn Hotel. Uh, Mo Dalitz that I mentioned a second ago was the kind of the hidden owner of, the, of that hotel. And Howard Hughes was, uh, would take an entire floor the entire time he was there. But the hotel owners weren't making profit out of the hotel rooms, they were making profit out of gamblers and therefore nobody on that floor was gambling. Uh, Howard Hughes was very nocturnal and reclusive by then. And so they told him they'd want him to move out. And so he said, 
the hell with that, I'll just buy the place. Um, and he paid, uh, I think I wrote it down, an astronomical sum of uh, $10 million, I think, for, for that property. Um, and it was $12 million five, as I recall, actually. And then he decided to buy the prop hotel, so he bought the Frontier across the way and the Silver Slipper because the flashing light there was going into his bedroom and bothering him at night. <laughs> Uh, he bought the Stardust Hotel, and then he started buying some property. Then, and a huge part of Las Vegas' this community right now is called Summerlin, which is his mother's maiden name. And that's where the company transitioned after many years later. But he, he brought with him an aura of respectability and credibility that hadn't pre-existed. Uh, he was an internationally known, you know, million, multi-millionaire, billionaire probably. And nobody knew how eccentric he'd become. So it was different. It was, oh, we don't really know who owns these hotels in Las Vegas. Howard Hughes does. So that was one of the significant transitions that occurred. And he surrounded himself uh, f with uh, re respectable accountants and started looking at the process differently. Most of his uh, aides were uh, members of the Mormon church. Uh, for, for whatever the reason, he felt uh, comfort in that. And they started looking at hotels not just as gaming alone, but how do we make money in the restaurants, how do we make money in the rooms, et cetera. And it began a process of change. Uh, today, uh, more money is made in, in restaurants and shopping than in gaming. Uh, and that's part of the evolution. And, and this man was, at the same time about, was one of the first uh, or second visionaries. It was 1962. 62. Yeah, uh, that, that man's name is Jay Sarno. And Jay Sarno uh, was a friend of Jimmy Hoffa's. He'd built the Cabana Hotel, I think, initially in Atlanta and built one, I think, at Palo Alto or someplace. He came to Las Vegas. He was an inveterate gambler himself, but he was a creative genius with the less than desirable personal life. But uh, in any case, uh, he overindulged in virtually everything. But he came up with this idea of this hotel with fountains, like he'd done in a smaller scale and elsewhere. He got a $35 million loan. Let's give you a financial perspective. The Dunes Hotel had opened in 1955 for $5 million and had 120 slot machines, which was unheard of. <laughs> 7,000 rooms in the city at that time. There's now 120,000. Uh, Sarno came in and he was going to build this magnificent place, and think he decided to build a themed hotel. So there was a change, and he built Caesar's Palace because he wanted every person, and he was very chauvinistic, he wanted all the men to feel like they were Julius Caesar and have be treated uh, by women in togas and so on in the Bacchanal restaurant where they would feed grapes and the like and uh, you have big fountains coming in. And uh, He followed the theme rather meticulously even to the point of putting signs on the door that say, do not disturb us. D e i s t r u b s, and so he helped facilitate a change. Now, he's also an instrumental in my family's history. Every Sunday night, when my father was at the Riviera, uh, my sister, myself, and my mother would go eat with my father. That was the only dinner during the week that we would eat with him because he worked constantly, um, and it was never anybody else there except one night. Uh, all of a sudden, and I was just in college at the time, this portly little guy is sitting at the table, and uh, rather than the family discussion, he's talking about this idea of, of his to my dad, in between flattering my dad profusely, uh, and his idea was to build a circus and, you know, have trapeze over the casino's head and elephants walking around and slides and knock girls out of bed and do all these things. It, it was the only time in my life after that dinner that my father actually asked me what I thought of something that related to his business. And we walked out and he said, he looked at me and he said, what'd you think of that? And I said, I think that's the stupidest idea I ever heard in my life. But as you can see, as you can uh, see here, my father disagreed <laughs> and left the Riviera Hotel and was one of the uh, main owners of the Circus Circus Hotel. Um, until shortly before he died when he sold his interest and owned a little place in front called the Slots of Fun. Uh, but uh, he uh, ended up partnering with Jay Sarno. And Jay was the next visionary, and there's a book written about him recently. Um, but he was one of the 
people who's uh, most visionary in, in making those changes. Start with Buggy C, you go to Jay Sarno, and, and we'll move on to, uh, to another person. So the... about this time, you went to the University of Santa Clara. I did, yeah. And uh, got a college education and had a couple of odd jobs in the summer. You want to talk about what you oh, did? Yeah. <laughs> um, I was a, a lifeguard at uh, Riviera Hotel. And I use this as a comparison, is that why are these nightclubs in Las Vegas so popular now? I mean, they're just a room with a DJ now, and people are paying thousands of dollars, young people, you know, have thousands of dollars to go in this place. And I figured it out. It's like when I was a lifeguard. All year long at school, I was just some gangly, lanky, clumsy guy. And in the summer, I was the lifeguard. And every girl wanted to go out with the lifeguard. And that's the concept that works in these nightclubs, in my opinion, is that there's no place for a woman to sit, except the men, and the men are all buying these tables at an exorbitant price, and they'll come over and ask them if they can sit with them, et cetera. So it works in that concept. So one of the young ladies I asked out on a date, and I use the same standard stupid line about, what a, you know, I'm just a poor lifeguard, and the only thing I can afford is to drive in movie theater across the street, which had a drive in movie theater on the strip. You can imagine the, the value of that property. And so we went there, and, but afterwards she was undaunted and insisted that we go back to the Riviera. Well, I was scared to death because I'm dating a customer. My dad's going to kill me. You know, I don't want him to know any of this. But the lounge shows at that time were you know, open and just to, based on the availability uh, and just with two drink minimum. So as we walked in, thank God there was this long line in front of the lounge show. And I felt relieved. I said, oh, I'm sorry, you know, uh, and I'm just, we're not going to be able to get in. And she was a little disappointed, and we started walking past the lounge show, and the maitre d' saw me, and he said, oh, Bob, how are you? Would you like to come in? <laughs> I said, well, you're awfully busy. He said, that's not a problem. Stand here. So she and I stood there and waited a minute, and pretty soon somebody came by carrying a table, and then somebody came by carrying chairs. <laughs> And they went down front center, moved everything else aside, put the table down, put the chairs down. He brought us in, sat us down, cocked a waitress, came up, and she asked the young lady what she'd like to drink. And then she looked at me and said, would you like your usual? <laughs> and at that point, uh, my date looked at me and said, do they treat all the lifeguards this good? <laughs> now, the, the other story gives you an idea. You know, Las Vegas, in the early days, was even more gaming centric than it is and the shows were different than they are now and so we had little show girls. So I was at Santa Clara University and I think it was my sophomore junior year or so and my roommate was from Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, my first roommate was also from Omaha but he only lasted a few weeks because he thought I was a heathen from hell because I was from Las Vegas. But this other was more uh, objective and so he, I invited he and two other guys to come, and we're in Las Vegas, and I said, I'm going to show them what a glib guy I am. We'll go see an afternoon lounge show, like a topless show. So we go into this place. There are very few people there. We're down in the front, and they had various entertainers. And finally they said, and now the star of our show, the beautiful, vivacious Francine. And this gorgeous five-foot, nine-inch brunette comes out, um, serenely topless, and I looked up and I said, oh my God, that was my date to the senior ball. <laughs> and of course, these three guys from Omaha are looking at me and said, oh, you're so full of it. This is, you know, don't, we're not that stupid just because we're from Nebraska. <laughs> and after a little while, the lights changed a little bit and she looked down in the middle of her number and stopped and said, oh, Bobby. <laughs> so I'm, you don't get that kind of credibility very often, but, <laughs> uh, but she was common of, of a lot of the, uh, more attractive young ladies that might go in that direction, and a lot of guys worked in, in casinos because that was the primary industry. Now, when you were at the University of uh, Santa Clara, your father was indicted. Yes, that and was my senior year, and my mother had called me. Most of my communications with the family, I was always with my mother. <clears throat> my father was very quiet as it related to us, uh, and they told me he'd been indicted. I. I was going to drop out and come home and said, well, there's nothing you can do, so you know, just don't worry about it. It's going to work out. It did. They ended up dropping charges against him. But he and several others were charged with what was characterized as skimming, which is income tax evasion. So the federal government had suggested that they were not reporting all the money that came into the casino. Uh, but it proved that they didn't have 
evidence to substantiate that. And it was, however, the beginning of an era in which the federal government took a higher interest in Las Vegas and started uh, an evolution of national oversight to the gaming industry. Now, you went into the Army Reserves about this time, and you were raised Catholic, but you went in as Jewish. Uh, yeah, well, care I, to explain? I have a lot of uh, Jewish friends who were kind enough to point out to me that while I was going to be in basic training and advanced infantry, the high holidays were going to come up. And I wasn't going to get to get off if I was Catholic. So when the, I went in, uh, had a little sheet that said religious preference, and I said, hell, I prefer to be Jewish. <laughs> so I was, in fact, uh, Jewish for four months. Uh, a few days after I would gotten there, the sergeant uh, had me fall out, and I thought, oh, God, they figured this out. I'm going to be court-martialed or whatever. And he said, Miller, you've had some ROTC. You're the ranking Jew. You have to take everybody to synagogue tomorrow. <laughs> Oh, my God. <laughs> well, fortunately, on the way to synagogue, uh, the guys who were actually Jewish came up to me and said, look, we've taken up a collection. We want to go to the PX every Saturday instead of the synagogue. So I was saved that. But in a, in a non-humorous sense, it gave me a life experience that uh, enhanced or exemplified how I already felt about bigotry. Most of my father's partners were Jewish. Uh, you know, I would hear secondhand about how people were mistreated, and, and uh, it, it, I've never been able to tolerate any form of bigotry. And what happened there was I actually had a captain in the U.S. Army that would run along as I was doing laps and tell me to hurry up. He was lighting up those furnaces. So that level of ignorance of a person who was in a position of responsibility uh, gave me a personal appreciation, you know, for... Uh, the worst sense of, of bigotry. So it was a learning experience as well. So then you uh, finished school, went to law school in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. uh, did some work as a bailiff during that period? Yeah, in between, uh, and this came up the other day because we celebrated the 50th anniversary of JFK's assassination, and, and the reporter interviewing me, uh, four years later, I was between college and law school. I'd, I'd done the Army part. I'd moved here, was working for Farmers Insurance, trying to show my parents I could get a job. I came down here, opened up a newspaper, got a job at Farmers Insurance, and, and worked there until I started law school. And, and I took a speed reading class across, uh, class, uh, across from the Ambassador Hotel uh, and went across the street to see an RFK rally. Um, I was a sergeant in the Army and a private that I knew came up to me, and he was a photographer. And he, we both went in to watch the speech. We'd been in the lounge the next door. We went in to watch the speech. And then he said, I'm going to go take some pictures. Do you want to come with me? I said, no, not really. So I went back into the lounge where we were isolated. There was music and, and didn't know what was going on. And Armijo, as his name, came in. He's about half my size, grabbed me, pulled me out, literally, physically, mumbling stuff like they shot him. I think he's dead. This is crazy. But that, that. And I got in the hall, and it was like you could cut the air with a knife. It was just a surreal experience. Uh, we weren't allowed to take our cars out of the parking lot. We were cleared first and then told don't come back until tomorrow and so on. So I, I wasn't visually present when RFK was murdered, but I was nearby. Uh, and then after my first year of law school, which was at Loyola downtown here, uh, the prospect of most people, my daughter's in law school now, my son had gone to law school, and they usually you know, work in a law firm. Well, if you work in a law firm and you're just between your first and second year or even your second and third, basically they have you be in the library doing research. I sure as hell didn't want to spend the whole summer in the library. I'd been in the library all, all winter. And I had worked a, a brief while for the Clark County Sheriff's Department before law school. So the sheriff, Ralph Lamb, was a friend of my dad's. He called the sheriff here, Pete Pitches, and said, what can we do? Well, in those days, you didn't have to go to, to uh, the academy before you started working. You could go and do start on-the-job training and go to the next academy class. So he hired me to be a bailiff in Department 72 in and for the Superior Court of the County of Los Angeles. And my job was to take prisoners from a lockup into the courtroom and sit in the courtroom. A rule at that time, which I, I can hardly believe, but we weren't allowed to carry a gun between the lockdown and there, and also the prisoners were supposed to be unhandcuffed. I had seven murder trials that summer. <laughs> I'm walking these murderers down the hall. Uh, fortunately, you know, they don't realize quite how young I am, and I have no experience. 
Uh, one of them starts querying me about, you know, where's my gun? And I'm telling him stuff like, you don't want to know where it is. You don't want to know where it is. And one of the cases I took was the retrial of one of the defendants in the uh, Onionfield murder case, although he went into the courtroom handcuffed, made some off-the-hand comments to me, and uh, the prosecutor wanted to introduce him. The judge decided that even though he'd volunteered the statements, he didn't want to have them in. But it was, it was an interesting experience for me. The following summer, I did the same thing in Las Vegas. So I was actually a police officer uh, commission carrying a gun to the risk of myself and everybody else uh, for two summers. And then you moved back to Las Vegas and uh, as, a, as a lawyer and you work, can we have slide 13 please? And, and you work for both the sheriff's department and for uh, the police department. And yeah, I, yeah, I start out as a deputy DA and then Ralph Lamb is the fellow without the hat on. Uh, he was a 16 year sheriff of Las Vegas very powerful individual. Uh, you might have seen the Vegas TV, uh, TV program this past year on CBS. Unfortunately, it didn't last because they didn't follow Ralph's stories as well as they should have. But he, for example, was the sheriff and was considered the second most powerful person in the state of Nevada, next only to the governor. His one brother was the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, another brother was the chairman of the county commission, and a brother-in-law was the chairman of the city council. Uh, so they pretty much had control of whatever they wanted. Uh, and he was a tough old cowboy. Uh, you know, my biggest job as a police attorney was to convince him, you know, we have to have a reason other than he's a no good son of a bitch for arresting somebody. <laughs> uh, but uh, Ralph, uh, one example that's in the book is uh, him dealing with the Hells Angels. Uh, they were just gaining their national reputation for being Hellcats, terrorizing a lot of smaller communities in California. They come in a large group to Las Vegas. He finally corralled one of them. Uh, arrested him, took him downtown and said, look, I'm going to let you out and I know you guys haven't got any money so I want you to go up to the Mount Charleston over there and there's a park up there and you'll all be fine up there. So the guy gets out, gets rounds the rest of them up and goes up there so they can have a place to spend the night. Unbeknownst to them, Ralph had surrounded the place with cops and he arrested all of them. Took them downtown, put them in the booking cell after he made sure they were sanitary by shaving their heads and delousing them. And then uh, their attorney came in from Los Angeles, uh, raising all kinds of hell, saying, you know, he demanded to talk to his clients. And Ralph said, I'll accommodate you, and took him down, let him go into the holding cell, closed the door, and came back the next morning <laughs> to a, an infuriated attorney who said, what, what do you think you're doing? And, uh, and he said, look, well, I figured, you know, there's about 35 of these guys, and you want to talk to them, I figured it's going to take you some time. So I've just given you time. So and he Finally, they worked out a deal and ran him out of town. But that's kind of how Ralph approached things at that era. Uh, he's finally lost an election in 1979, which is when I was elected district attorney of, uh, in that s similar election. Uh, but he's still around. He's 90 some years of age, and he epitomizes the old cowboy transition of Las Vegas. Now, you were district attorney, and um, given your background, that's an unusual. Uh, position to, uh, to get, but you were a district attorney and during that time you were a champion of victims' rights. And that really put you on the map nationally in many ways as well. Yeah, it was a, it was not, it was a pragmatic decision really. Uh, no DA had ever been reelected in Las Vegas history. And so when I got elected and I defeated two former DAs in the process in very nasty campaigns, but uh, they uh, it, it just occurred to me, I said, all these groups are protesting outside because they don't think like they're being treated appropriately. So I pulled in the guy that, that was ran a victim witness unit, which was a new concept in the United States at the time. And I said, you know, how many agencies are there out in the community that uh, deal with crime victims? And there was about 15 or so. I said, get a hold of the chairman of each of them and make them your advisory board and have them come in here and give us some advice as to what we're going to do. I said, the other thing is we're going to establish a policy that said no case will be plea bargain, which was the buzzword, without the approval of the victim or me personally. Because I had, you know, like 40-some attorneys working for me. And I figured, you know, if we're going to catch hell about it, I want it to be my decision. Well, all the attorneys thought that was a stupid idea because they had legal training. These people were emotional and didn't have training. I said, yeah, because they had the gun in their face or they were raped. You weren't. Uh, so if you're a good attorney, you're going to be able to convince them this is the right result. And if it's not, you have to convince me that it's the right result. 
And so we're going to be clogging up your office every day. Well, they weren't because they were good and were able to talk to people and get them to understand. And so we resolve cases uh, without the kind of the normal upheaval. In the course of the process, I was also very involved in the National District Attorneys Association, subsequently becoming the national president. And uh, a, a guy came to, to speak to us whose son had been kidnapped, ultimately he was found murdered and severed head in Florida. He was a businessman. And he learned in the process that the way the system worked at the federal and the, and the state level even, that there wasn't a lot of communication about his missing son. So he flew all over Florida trying to let people know that his son was missing. Uh, and then he went to the federal government and said, you, you, you shouldn't have this big gap in time when someone's missing like that before it's an, an alert. And he picked up it in a national crusade. Uh, that man, uh, then I was selected in 1982 as one of uh, nine members of a task force on victims of crime by then President Ronald Reagan. Uh, I was one of two Democrats on there. And we brought this guy in to that group as well. His name is John Walsh. And John and I become close personal friends thereafter. He did ads for my campaigns. He's done ads for my son's campaigns. And probably one of the things that I'm most proud of accomplishing is that when Rupert Murdoch bought Fox TV, they decided they were going to get rid of America's Most Wanted. America's Most Wanted was a concept of you know, helping capped criminals. And instead of getting a movie star, I said, what about this John Walsh guy? He looks like a movie star, and you know, a lot of people don't realize his real background. And so he started that program and was very successful, but it didn't have the kind of ratings they wanted. They were going to get rid of it. So I got most of the governors, all the nation's district attorneys, uh, all the nation's attorneys general to write letters, et cetera. And John finally, they reinstated the show, and John had a press conference and, in an exaggerated sense, credited me uh, singularly with the person getting it back on the air. But whatever little, little role I had, I know I had some, and I'm, I'm very proud of that because uh, I thought that show was a great service to the United States. So, um, you yeah. know, in any case, uh, crime victims was kind of my mentor uh, in, as district attorney. And then you ran for uh, lieutenant governor. And can I have slide 11, please? Uh, when you ran for uh, lieutenant governor, some of the uh, a particular letter that had been written, uh, uh, an article was published in the uh, San Jose Mercury News about uh, s some of the things that uh, were purportedly said about you by a couple of uh, distant acquaintances of your father. And uh, can we, do we have the slide up? Well, let me, uh, I can give you the background. In, in every election, my father passed away in 1975. I had been about to become appointed to a lower court judicial position. So when he passed away, he knew that there was a good chance I was going to become a judge, which you know was his oh, great we, delight. We have it up something now. he yeah. couldn't even conceive of. Uh, and uh, at that point in time, he had passed away, but his specter never left. Every election, people attacked me based on my father, uh, based on his prior associations, uh, tried to mischaracterize him and the respectable person that he'd become in Las Vegas, et cetera. Uh, and in the run for lieutenant governor actually was a, a hotly contested race where John Walsh did an ad for me, President Reagan did an ad for my opponent, but, but John Walsh ad was better than the Reagan ad and I won that election. It was subsequent there too when the governor who had been re-elected to a second term was running for the U.S. Senate against an incumbent U.S. Senator named Chick Heck. Chick Heck was ranked the, the least effective member of the U.S. Senate. He and Jesse Helms <laughs> used to vote together. 98 to 2 because they were you know, the precursors to the Tea Party. And they, uh, he was losing badly, heck was. So he couldn't attack Dick Bryan, the incumbent governor. He couldn't find a, a niche to attack him, except he tried to characterize the state plane as a private jet. So he attacked me because I would become governor. And I had uh, a, a former business associate of my father named Carl Thomas who had been caught in wiretaps conversing and dealing with uh, members of organized crime from Kansas City and helping steal money from some of the hotels in Las Vegas. And uh, he had mentioned my name in one of those, saying that he knew me. Uh, fortunately, uh, the person on the other end, Nick Savella, said, well, did, do we want this guy? And 
Carl Thomas, who's a, my dad's former associate, said, hell no, he didn't want him. Um, and and at the same time, uh, this fellow here you might have uh, heard of named Tony Splatro, he's the one on the right, that's his brother next to him. Well, on, I guess it would be your right, yes, he's the shorter one. He had changed the dynamics of organized crime in Las Vegas from a place where money was made to one where street crime was evident. And he was a, a hardened murderer uh, and was involved in bookmaking, book making, uh, shark, loan sharking and things that, and burglary, et cetera. And he'd been black bo uh, booked from the casinos and there was a case coming up. Well, he had spoken to Carl Thomas, I mean, excuse me, he had spoken to a man named Alan Dorfman who represented the Teamsters Union and Dorfman, and said, Dorfman said to him, well, I know Bob Miller because I was the DA at the time. And he, Dorfman had known my dad because of that's where my dad's financing had come through those central state funds. And he said, well, I'll just ask him if we can't change the judge. So he called me. He didn't explain what it was about. He just said, how does the judges select it? I told him, and he said, well, can you change that? And I said, no. He said, you sure there's no way you can change it? I said, no. And that was the end of the conversation. But that conversation and the co one by Carl Thomas uh, were the, f the banter that uh, Chicago, the incumbent senator, ran in a newspaper story in the San Jose Mercury News, of all places, uh, attacking me. Uh, and then denied that he had planted the story, but it was attacking me, saying that I was unsuitable to become governor of the state of Nevada. Uh, what we did and his campaign manager later told me it was the most effective response he'd ever seen is we had, I had every elected prosecutor and, and chief of police or sheriff, both parties and both parts of the state come to a press conference. Uh, the most strong line was from the sheriff of Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department is a combined entity of police department and sheriff's department and so it's run by a sheriff because of Ralph Lamb was the, the guy at the time and nobody was going to make him the second person. So the sheriff that succeeded him eventually was named John Moran. His line was the headline the next day is that uh, John Moran said, Sheriff Moran said that if Bob Miller is organized crime, so is the Pope. But the most telling person in the, in the meeting was a man named Stan Hunterton who was uh, the, the organized crime strike force attorney for Las Vegas during all this Spalatro era movie casino and went on to become the executive director of the presidential task force on organized crime. And he came forward and said, he was retired by then, he came forward and said, look, we had thousands of tapes and a lot of times we were taping the same place from different directions. He said, his name never came up. he would got nothing to do with this. And, and so, although it didn't get as much print as uh, John Moran's uh, Pope story, uh, to me, that was a very important thing to have somebody with that background make that statement. And so it backfired on them. Uh, and in fact, uh, Dick Bryan was elected to the U.S. Senate and I became governor of Nevada. And for the record, Spilatro's nickname was the Ant. Yeah, because one of the FBI agents uh, used to refer to him and say, that little pissant? <laughs> and he became known as Tony the Ant Spilatro. He, if you saw the movie Casino, he was Joe Pesci. Uh, Robert De Niro played Frank Rosenthal. Uh, and they were bigger than life at that time. Eventually their crew was caught burglarizing a place and our office worked with the feds to help turn some of them and that kind of led to the, that point. Plus they were overdoing it with their own contemporaries and Spilatro, as you're probably aware, was he and his brother there were both murdered uh, back in Chicago somewhere. And uh, as, in Indiana cornfield. As was uh, Dorfman, correct? Yeah, uh, Alan Dorfman, who I mentioned earlier, was shot in the back of the head outside of a restaurant in Chicago. Can we have slide 16, please? So this is really the third era and third visionary period of Las Vegas. We had, mm -hmm. we had Bugsy Siegel, we had Jay Sarno, and now we have Steve Wynn, who, yep. uh, and, and you were able to bring the governors to this hotel. And in the past, you were saying that attorney generals and others were not allowed to have their conventions in Las Vegas. That's right. It was you know, a battle. I got the DAs to change it, came to Vegas, and, and I, eventually as I became the national president, did the same thing with the governors. I became chairman of the national governors at one point. 
put things in context, remember the Dunes Hotel was built for $5 million, Riviera, similar amount. The Stardust Hotel 58 was built for $10 million. That was the biggest one at the time. Caesars uh, Palace, Kirk Akorian owned the land and uh, for about less than a million dollars. Later, years later, sold it for $9 million, but that was a $35 million project. So, and then the International in 1967, uh, the property alone was worth $5 million. And uh, so now we come all the way to Steve Wynn in uh, 1989 and a friend uh, named Michael Milken who helped him uh, with financing. Steve Wynn had been, an, uh, he and his father had been owners of the Frontier when Howard Hughes bought him out. And he'd made some money with that. Then he ran the liquor company in Las Vegas for a while, made some money with that. Then he bought the Golden Nugget downtown and upgraded it which was not the character of downtown. He changed it dramatically. He's sitting in there, a creative thinking guy. He's friends with Michael, who understands finance even better than Steve, and ended up building the Mirage Hotel, um, which is up there. That was a $630 million project. The, the first weekend that opened, we'd scheduled the Western governors to come meet in Las Vegas. And so about a week before it opened, I went to see you know, how we were doing, or was it all going to be okay. And my chief of staff and I walked in and they were tearing out the carpet. I said, what's happening? He said, well, it's the wrong shade. Can't you see it's the wrong shade? And I said, okay, Steve. And he said, I said, but you're opening in a week. Ah, it'll all be in here. We're going to from Canada. We're going to get it all in. We'll have it all laid up. Don't worry about it. So I said, well, this is an amazing place. The overhead must be just phenomenal. Ah, it's only a million dollars be a million dollars a month. What is it, a million dollars a week? He said, no, it's a million dollars a day. I said, a million dollars a day? You're not concerned? No, no, we're going to make 300000 off the slot machines. We'll make 300000 off of the restaurants and concessions. We'll make 400000 off of the rooms, and the table games will all be profit. He took in $2 million a day the first year it opened. An interesting thing of the Mirage, it, 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 uh, the design is completely different. Uh, as you can see, the triangular component of it. The attraction is the exterior. It was the first time that there was an attraction to a hotel, not just a theme like, like uh, Sarno had done with Caesars, but you have the fountains out in front, et cetera. Uh, and <laughs> one of the interesting side stories is it comes to the ribbon cutting, and there was going to be a special guest that nobody knew who it was, and there's thousands of people lined up, and Steve and I are standing in front of the ribbon to cut it. And a special guest comes up, and it's uh, baby white tigers from Siegfried and Roy. So they go in, and we cut the ribbon. And now nobody had opened the place this big or understood what was going to happen. As soon as we cut the ribbon, thousands of people started running to come in. And guess who was in their way? <laughs> and pretty soon, some security guards were pulling Steve and I off to the side so that we weren't trampled to death. Um, but... Uh, that proved to, to start an era of themed hotels, uh, many of which Steve Wynn was personally responsible for. Now, you were the longest serving governor in Nevada history, two terms plus half of, uh, of, your, of uh, uh, Dick Bryant's uh, term as well. So, uh, Some you, people pronounce that longest serving governor. <laughs> longest answer. serving governor. And you were approached to run for Senate by an actor from this town. Yeah, I was flattered. Uh, I'd been out of office a couple years, and uh, there was the, the junior senator, Dick Bryan, had been the governor, surprised everybody, and he called me and he said, look, I'm not going to run again, which was a shock to everyone. He said, I want you to run. And I said, I don't know. I, I, I've kind of changed my mindset. I never intended to be in this forever. And so then I started getting phone calls. and. and Al Gore called me from a plane on the way back from Africa, and then within 48 hours, President Clinton had called Hillary Clinton, Tipper Gore. It was going on and on like this because, you know, just like now, the balance of, of uh, senators was pretty close. Uh, one of the arguments they used to try and convince me was to say, you get along so well with Republicans, we'll have you go be the person to work things out. And you think that's an incentive? <laughs> But one day I came in and my secretary was all flustered. And I said, what's going on? And she said, Michael Douglas just called you from a movie set. I said, oh, and he's going to call back. And I said, okay. So after a little while he called. 
and he started giving me a speech about how he was going to help me and he wanted me to run for the Senate and so on and so forth. And I, of course, knew what had happened is that, you know, some of the other Democratic senators had called him and were friends with him and said, you got to help talk this guy into running. Uh, but I said, uh, you know, have we ever met? He said, oh, no, but I know all these things about you. You're just a great guy. So I had this mental image of him saying to Sharon Stone on a movie set, hold that pose a minute. i got to read this about this Bob Miller. What a hell of a guy this guy is. So, you know, I politely listened to it and thanked him. And then I ultimately decided not to run. And I went to a boxing match, and he and his wife, then Catherine Zeta-Jones, were about three seats in on the aisle. So I stood on the aisle on purpose for a long, you know, maybe 20 minutes. It's the damnedest thing my biggest fan didn't even recognize me. <laughs> Can we have a slide 17? So we started with that picture of Las Vegas that was mostly sand, and now this is a contemporary picture of Las Vegas. So how, how does it feel, looking back at your career and seeing this build, to have been part of that? Well, I take a great deal of pleasure and pride in being able to have been a small part of it, and, but certainly to have experienced it. And I love sitting with audiences like this, but also especially in Nevada where some people are brand new residents, a good many of them are brand new. Some have been there a little bit longer and, and saw some of the transitions I did. Um, there's two dynamics that, that need to come in there. There, there was uh, two businessmen, bankers, uh, a Jewish banker from Los Angeles, Jerry Mack, and a Mormon banker from Utah, Perry Thomas. They formed a Valley Bank and came in and started conventional financing, which was a significant change in Las Vegas. Kirk Ikorian came right after Howard Hughes, and he also brought that aura of respectability that is important. And subsequently, his properties were sold to the Hilton Corporation, which became the first publicly traded company. So that's the evolution. And the evolution now, that all these are publicly traded companies, and it's financially infeasible, as well as with the restrictions that are there, for undesirables to be a, a part of the process anymore. Uh, the dollar amount, the scrutiny, et cetera, has driven organized crime out of there. And the only people that steal from you is uh, the god of gamblers <laughs> that want your money, which, by the way, goes primarily to education. And I want to appreciate your contribution to Nevada's needy school children. <laughs> so let's uh, go to some questions. And uh, so what were some of the biggest obstacles you faced in becoming governor, given your family's former relationships with colorful characters? Well, the first election I had, I was a judge. I'd been appointed, and I had to go down and decide what I was going to, how I was going to appear on the ballot. And so I thought, I'm judicial. I should be Robert Miller. And about an hour before the close of filing, the clerk called me and said, you know, we got two Robert Millers on the ballot here. And I rushed down, changed my name to Bob, which is more symptomatic of me anyhow. Uh, went around town putting Bob stickers on everything. And it, the other Robert Miller was a baggage clerk at the airport who come up on some newfound cash uh, and filed against me. So that was the first taste that I had of politics. Uh, as district attorney, uh, the prior district attorneys that ran against me were two prior district attorneys and a defense attorney who didn't like me from when I was a judge because I tried to run a very kind of a strict courtroom and he didn't, that wasn't his attitude. His name was Bucky Buchanan, and he actually had a TV show for a while about being the guy that represents pimps and whores and, and drives a Rolls Royce, um, and he hated me. So what really happened, in my opinion, well, I can't verify for sure, is that Joe Conforti, uh, who ran whorehouses in northern Nevada, was good friends with one of the candidates, Roy Woofter, who had a chance to, to, to win, and you know, it was certainly a, up in the air. But you can't have him be the one to attack me. It would hurt him if he attacked me. So all of a sudden, Bucky Buchanan had some money, and he was attacking me viciously. My, diet, my dad was dead. He was attacking my mother, who was a gambler, and made you know, just a mere association of gaming uh, a basis of attack. Uh, so that was in that election, I, I overcame that. Uh, I was reelected district. And you got, you got the, the hmm? prostitute's vote. Yeah, yeah, he did. <laughs> he still has. Uh, then. 
I did get reelected district attorney because I had evade, I found the secret that evaded all my predecessors. I ran out of post, and it's a lot easier that way. Uh, so when I ran for lieutenant governor, again, it was the, the tax on my dad and the fact that one of his associates, Carl Thomas, had been involved in, in this scheme and had gone to prison and, and the, the whole Teamster connection, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then the one that you heard about when I was running for governor. So it, it, it pretty much was a pattern of always trying to bring back the specter of my father uh, and somehow bootstrap that to make me be a person who was uh, not suited to be in public office. Uh, but I had a law enforcement background and always had strong law enforcement support and that countered it. Next question. What do you think are the biggest opportunities for Las Vegas and for Nevada in the next 10 years or so? Well, we're in a different era. Uh, as President Clinton said in the forward of the book, uh, we, and, and Mike mentioned earlier, uh, we doubled our population for every 10 years in the 1900s, which is probably the only city in the history of the world maybe that's done that. That's not going to happen anymore. We're at about two million. Uh, we've slowed down. The recession hit us hard. A lot of the major properties still are, you know, overfinanced. Uh, we are seeing some new interest again through you out of uh, Malaysia has bought what was a Stardust and was going to become Echelon. Um, you know, we've seen there's a group that bought the Sahara Hotel uh, and they're renovating that. So there is. I think we'll see some slow growth in gaming and continued diversification of the economy. Um, the one thing Las Vegas is so far ahead of any place else in the United States or proximate here to that it's a place to go to if you, you, know, you just want to see Las Vegas. Uh, Macau, on the other hand, you know, where I spend part of my time because of the wind board, uh, brings in six times the revenue Las Vegas does. So you know, it's not necessarily going to be the epitome of a gaming center, but it is the forerunner, and it has uh, a combination, I think, that will stand it in decent stead going we, forward. Uh, what other revenue can Nevada generate outside of the gambling and hospi uh, hospitality industries? We have uh, more gold mining revenue than uh, almost any country. Uh, it's the first in the United States, but it's also like third in the whole world in terms of production of gold. Uh, we have some ranching, some manufacturing, some warehousing, uh, but it's challenged and it's something that we continually need to do is to, to, to diversify the economy. Um, Zappos is there now and he is investing a lot of time, personal money and energy into renovating downtown Las Vegas, et cetera. I think that might uh, entice some uh, new businesses. Northern Nevada got Amazon uh, location up there. so. Uh, we just have to keep reaching out. We have uh, a reasonable tax structure, but at the same time, we're in, a, in an era where uh, we're not raising any new revenues, and as a result, our education system isn't going the right direction. The right balance has to be found there. We need to improve the quality of education in Nevada. So uh, do we have any questions, uh, live questions? Wait for the microphone, please. And what's your take on internet, internet gambling? in the, its future and its effect actually on uh, Nevada. Yeah, uh, it's very new to Nevada as, as I'm sure you know, um, but uh, just yesterday there was a story that the two companies that are out there with it already are making significant profits uh, even though it's limited in its scope and, uh, and it's limited to people in Nevada. Uh, I think it's inevitable, I don't necessarily a proponent of it, but uh, it's something that's been existent in Europe for a long time. That I'm on the board of International Game Technology, so we have a relationship with companies that are involved in their gaming there. They have found out how to make it socially acceptable without uh, enhancing problem gaming, et cetera, uh, doing the right kind of checks. Uh, one of the major casino operators in Las Vegas, Sheldon Adelson, that owns a Venetian and one of the wealthiest people in, in the world, actually, uh, is very much an opponent of it, and he's trying to, uh, to stop it. Uh, most of the other casinos are either are trying to figure out how to position themselves for what they consider to be uh, in, the inevitability of it. And, but it, it, I, we discussed it, it was discussed even when I was governor, you know, I was governor 89 to 99, and one of the big problems is how do you raise revenue from it? I mean, who, who gets taxed? It's easy when it's all in one state, but when you start crossing borders, 
how does that work out? And that's why the federal government, I think, in part, hasn't reached a, a national conclusion. With global competition from places like Macau, what continues to make Las Vegas stand out? Well, I kind of answered that already. I mean, we have the history um, and we have, uh, you know, the, the shows. Macau doesn't have any shows. The Chinese, as yet, are, are at the present time, are very short visitors, 24 hours, and all they want to do is gamble. There's no cocktail waitresses. People walk around serving water and tea to them. Uh, there's very little interest in going to the nice restaurants. Uh, there's only one show there, and they have to kind of backfill it because uh, people want to do other things. But that's changing. Uh, Koh Tai, uh, which is a secondary component of Macau, it's a, Macau's like islets, and Koh Tai is a landfill where all the big properties are going in now. As those rooms all go in, and there's going to be four to five major hotels opening in 2016, including Wynn, including Parisian, which is a Venetian property, and some of the others that are international in their ownership, uh, people will stay longer. And... Uh, you know, that, that dynamic will change. But Las Vegas will always be Las Vegas. It's where it started. Here's an interesting one. What were your uh, toughest moral dilemmas? Um, you know, I, don't, I don't know that I have a, a, a ready answer for that. Uh, you know, it, it's difficult in, in elections uh, because they're, they're so negative anymore. And you, although everybody says they don't want to vote for the person who's negative, if someone starts attacking you and you don't respond and, and in some respects point out their shortcomings, you're not going to win. And so you get caught in this trap. And, and uh, it's not something I love, but it's just a, it's a reality. And you know, attacks on me, I, we've outlined what they were, and et cetera. But, you know, Everybody that runs elections uh, does their homework on the other person on the negative context. So that, that was always difficult. From a personal vantage point, what was difficult is to maintain a, a good family life when you're as busy as a governor is. Uh, my wife and I worked really hard at that, and I'm proud of our kids. And um, We had our son is 37. He's the Secretary of State in Nevada in his second term, just finishes the national president, is running for attorney general. Um, and Washington Post picked him as one of ten young Americans to watch recently, five Democrats, five Republicans. Fox News had him on as one of those. Uh, and he'll have a tough race for attorney general, it looks like. Uh, and so I'm proud of him. I'm proud of both of our daughters. Uh, one daughter runs an animation studio in, in uh, New York. The other was 12 years after brother and sister because she was born after we became governor. There was something to celebrate. And uh, she's a, in her second year of law school here at USC, so I'm proud of, of the ability to be able to keep our family together. Another live question over here. Oh. Oh, wait, 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 wait for the microphone. <laughs> I can hear you, but maybe others might not be able to. Uh, two questions. One is water. Uh, I'm very concerned about the Southwest and you know New Mexico, Arizona, and uh, Nevada. And the other one is, uh, would you reconsider running for Senate? We actually need some rational senators. <laughs> well, I'll start with the latter. And no, I, I, I won't run. I think my day has come and gone. My son might at some point. In fact, he was courted to some degree in the last Senate election. But he, like me, has the unfortunate uh, circumstance of being a moderate. And moderates seem to be extinct anymore. Nobody wants to work with anybody else. And I had the good fortune, the Republican leader of the, uh, in the state legislature passed away recently, but uh, he made the statement before he did that, you know, compromise is not a dirty word. And so he and I would battle all the time, but we knew we were going to reach a resolution. Uh, and he, by the way, his widow is supporting my son crossing party lines, as is the, the widow of one of the Republican governors, et cetera. And my son prosecuted ACORN because even though it's a Democratic machine, they were violating the law. So he looks at those things those ways, and so do I, but that doesn't play well in politics anymore to be a moderate, and I think it's unfortunate and has to change, but I don't want to redo that in, in my way of thinking. And uh, the, first, the first part was water, which is, remember a former governor of Arizona said to me, an old line, but it's just, you know, uh, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting over. And a lot of the water for southern Nevada, where it's a bigger problem, comes from the Colorado River, and when the Colorado River law was written, uh, it, Las Vegas had nobody, had about 6,000 people. So it was not envisioned to be what it is today. So 
I work with the water authorities in Southern Nevada, and we had a, a really dynamic woman running it. We've gotten to pooling water, uh, which will hopefully be sufficient for it. There are some aquifers in Southern Nevada that help part of it. There's water available in, in Eastern Nevada, uh, and there's a big fight now going on of whether some of that can be diverted away from the ranchers there down to the urban population. But water is a big concern and, and always will be in the desert. I mean, we are in fact a desert, so. One last live question uh, over here. How did you escape uh, the temptations that I'm sure that the uh, organized crime offered you? Uh, N nobody actually offered me really? anything. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, that, that made it easy to escape it. Uh, you know, the, I guess because like the, the phone call from uh, Alan Dorfman, I mean, I just, I didn't know why he was calling, you know, his question, I just, no, you're not gonna, I'm not going to change anything. And uh, at the time, those people like him were part of Las Vegas society because they'd been part of the financial structure of it. Uh, but they didn't, uh, they didn't approach me, and obviously I was on the opposite side of Spilatro um, because we were prosecuting his, his gang, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, it just, it wasn't a problem um, because it didn't happen. And you were, uh, you had a reputation as law, the law and order governor. Yeah, my background having been in law enforcement for so many years, uh, you know, I think that probably steered people away from the concept otherwise. Governor, thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Oh, I forgot the Don't light. forget his book is for sale over here, and he will sign books right now. Thank you.